I'm going to just kick this off here a little bit. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it's very cool. I, I don't, this hasn't happened that often where you get to sit in situ, as it were, which is r right. very cool. The crowd ties the room together. The yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm going to start out just with a brief introduction and, and then ask Will some questions. And I'm going to start with a kind of a, a, an invocation from a high priest of art, the late uh, Dave Hickey, who said, uh, unfortunately, art is not a liberal art. It does not constitute a body of knowledge in any traditional sense. It has scrap heaps of theories and oodles of information, but no true proof, internal confirmation, dictionary, or stable contextual reference. And whenever I read that and think about it, I think two things. I think correct and hallelujah. Um, and also that most of my favorite artists are, are essentially collectors of arcane information that in their hands somehow does become a meaningful body of knowledge that, that adds up in some, uh, that adds up in some non-Euclidean way that's really, really difficult to articulate in language. And, also, most of those kinds of artists, um, because of how they think, and, and Will is part of this group, love making books. And so my introduction to Will's work was not through work proper, but through a book, a zine that he did in 2014, I believe it was, which is wholly his collection of snapshots of Elvis taken by fans in the 1970s. And it's mostly of the king sitting in cars, looking very regal in cars with sunglasses. Um, and over the last few years, Will and I have had a, a kind of an a, a, a ongoing conversation, sometimes in person and sometimes uh, via you know, text and email and calls. And so this morning when I got up, I thought like I would try to make just a, a, a short list, and, and this is a, a very abbreviated edited list, of Will's the, the, the bodies of knowledge that Will uh, um, oh. works from, <laughs> works from. <clears throat> Obviously art, very, very, very widely defined to include almost everything in the built environment. Horror and monster movies, music from death metal to Tejano to the Ghetto Boys to primitive country and western. Fiction centering on uh, a lot of now overlooked pretty hard-bitten Western novelists like Charles Williford and Leonard Gardner, conspiracy theories, extreme human ritual, sometimes religious, for example, snake handling, and you know, you'll get maybe a little bit of that in here, and, and the natural world, especially the sort of very alien-seeming flora and fauna of the American West, which is, which is mostly where uh, Will has lived and, and, and grown up. And so with that, to foreground us just a little bit, I thought maybe you, I would ask you first just um, how these objects came to be uh, and where they were made. And you, you, you talked a little bit about this when we first came in, but right. the, these have a, um, these all look as if they come from the natural world, but they actually are come from a, 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 a tradition or a, a commercial world. Right. So where I grew up in Houston, like sort of within the range uh, that I could access by a bicycle, there was like a model shop, you know, and um, they sold like model cars, model trains, and figurative models, and uh, you know, the kind that you like glue together. They come in a box, and they're, they're all the pieces, and you glue them together, and you paint them. And it's like, from the outside, it looked like a toy shop, you know? And so I felt like I wanted to go and check it out. And then you go in, and it's like, there's sort of like this culture that was apparent. And it was like these old guys in there, they were smoking cigarettes, kind of like Vietnam vets, and, you know, huddled over this table. And they had built like all these models, and mainly like, you know, military vehicles and trains. And it was like the aisles were just these boxes stacked up and I kind of wandered through and I had like a little bit of money so I could buy like one, one model, you know. And I bought this thing, 
thinking that the toy, it was a toy and the toy was inside of it and I opened it and it was like all these pieces, you know, you had to glue together. Mm -hmm. I think like a lot of kids, I may have spent like 15 minutes trying to glue the thing together and then I like threw it into my closet, you know, <laughs> and moved on in life. Yeah. Um, but they were really ideally for adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're complicated. Yeah. It's right. very, it's like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Years later, I moved to Los Angeles, and like I was mad in, in this effort to sort of familiarize myself myself with the uh, city. And looking for art materials and ideas, I started combing like the swap meets. You know, and just, we call them flea markets in Texas. They call them swap meets out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They, do they have them here? They have stuff on the sidewalk here. People sell. Yeah, mm -hmm. stoop, um, stoop sales. Yeah. Stoop sales. But sale. it's kind of a different vibe. Stoop sales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I began to see like these guys who are selling these Ziploc bags full of random pieces from the models, you know, and it was just, and they're painted and they're broken, they're like little pieces of plastic and it'd be like a hand holding a gun, uh, a monkey paw, uh, you know, a rib cage, these little things, a, a crown, you know, a football helmet. Whatever, and I, I was, and they're cheap, you know, and I started buying them and collecting them, and I just sort of bought, I don't know, and after I had like a table in my studio, and I just sort of started setting up these tableaus of them. And simultaneously, like combing the swap meets, uh, my wife Stephanie and I were like going to every museum, and we went to the Getty, and the Getty was having this show of uh, Hellenistic bronzes. You know, and I was kind of, I was waiting for a bunch of stuff to arrive to LA, um, I didn't have any canvases, so I couldn't paint. So all I kind of been doing was staring at these models and kind of like moving them around. And I go into the Getty and it's like, there's a piece of an arm, there's a monster's head, there's a tiger, you know, and it, and it became very apparent that this was like the same thing as the mm -hmm. fucking models that were on the table, you know? Yeah. Fragments. These yeah. fragments. And, and not only do they like physically remind me of the, of the pieces of the models, but like there are these archetypes that are present, you know, and it was like the, there was a statue of Medusa, but I had like a figurine of Frankenstein, you know, and there was a statue of a, of a Roman emperor, and I had like a JFK with a missing head, you know, mm -hmm. and so, and I had made visual work where I had played a lot on like a Xerox machine, like I kind of always grew up playing on a Xerox machine, um, and I immediately started to think about like, what if I blew these little plastic pieces up to the scale of these bronzes? And so that was sort of the impetus for the work initially. Mm -hmm. um, and, and was part of, I mean, talking about this work here, part, part of the thought, even though those weren't, at the Getty they weren't painted, part of the discourse around those was that they had once been painted, or they once looked a lot more Life-like, mm -hmm. when right. you know, in yeah. in antiquity. Yeah. So I bought the book, you know, the show, and I go home and reading it, and it starts talking about like, well, this thing was painted, and this thing was painted, you know, and and when you see them, it looks so elegant, and the surface is so smooth and beautiful, and there's this richness to it. But the idea that they were painted like bright yellow, or, mm -hmm. or you know, in these garish colors was very interesting to me, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you started thinking too about, I mean, that, that show and the, the color started making you think about what would it be if, if we had right. objects like this that lasted in time. Yeah, yeah, and so it's like all this stuff I've been making, you know, like works on paper and like videos or like even paintings, you think like, you know, you're gonna do this stuff and like you're gonna show it in a room and like, uh, it's not going to last forever, you know, and this idea of of creating an object out of a metal that, like, could get buried in the earth and in 5,000 years or whatever, someone might find it, and it's completely authorless, uh, it has nothing to do with me, like, that was very interesting to me, you know, hmm. and then there's these connotations of, like, well, what do these things symbolize, you know, and if someone dug up a sculpture of Frankenstein 500 years from now, would it be like, well, these, there were these people that lived here and they worshiped a green monster. This is God and, right. and, so, and they worshiped tigers. And, yeah, and the idea of like myth-making 
like I, when, I, when I look at this show and I see um, all of it cited here this way, where, where are these, these things that um, are, you know, carry like vestiges of, of, of man you know, affecting some part, like fire and the dog collar, but then all these other things that could be from you know, the very beginning of time, just sort of beginning to grow. Um, so that, yeah, this idea of like a, a myth that's being formed. Um, and I think like from the Christian myth to like the Native American myths, Greek myths, all of these things where it's like the origin of something, you know, making, a, making the earth. Um, and I, like this especially, like when I think of like the swap meets and the model making set and like how this like mostly old guys that are doing this, like maybe kind of like lonely old guys that miss some part of, you know, whatever. But if you make that God being like, oh, you know, I'm just bored. I'm just gonna make something. Tinkering. Tinker, yeah. Like, yeah. I wonder what would happen if, and then just tinkering and making, making a world, um, making this sort of um, garden space, but like this um, idea of myth making, which is, you know, part of all of these objects. Yeah, and yeah. like how, you know, what it, what it indicates about us as a people in this moment. But I wonder if you can talk a bit about like the time, like the scope of time within this exhibition and how you're thinking of time in right. this space. Yeah, I worked on this for a, long, for a while. I started, the, I started this in LA and then I moved, to Texas, moved back to Texas where I grew up and I finished it there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there was a lot going on. It was you know pre-pandemic to now, basically a month ago I finished the stuff or whatever, you know. And so there are times where I was sort of thinking about like, the body of work started with these figurative things, started with the, uh, a JFK, you know. And so throughout looking at the pieces and thinking about this show, you know, and thinking about life and thinking about death and thinking about the world and like, is the world ending? I started to imagine, you know, like the absence of the figure, you know, and it was important initially to like show these works and try to figure out ways to put them into the world, not in a gallery context, you know, and so the first few that I made, we figured out ways to put them, you know, and so then there was at some point I knew I wanted to make a room of this stuff, you know, and I was interested in sort of like, you know, this natural world where I live in California there is a big open space and I, you know, and it was like, life slowed down and like people weren't driving to work and all of a sudden like, there wasn't smog in Los Angeles, you know? And animals started showing and, up in the city. And everything's like a little cleaner and yeah, and you see more birds and, and there was a writer that I like a lot named Charles Bowden and he was talking about this idea like, we think about the end of time being the end of us, you know? and really like the end of the world, the idea of the end of the world being the end of our civilization, but like if shit hits the fan and we're gone, the world might be better off. You know, yeah. the world might be this place like, like birds would be happier, or trees like would be other happier. other species might just be waiting on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For us to exit the scene. <laughs> yeah, and there was a time where like maybe we weren't here, I don't know, you know, and, uh, and so it's sort of like this weird thing where I was thinking about it as almost like this prehistoric uh, landscape, but also like post-apocalyptic at the same time, or mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah. There's like, what is this? Was it Smithson was talking about like you know ruins from the future? Yeah. Or like you know, in a way, you could look at these and think like what you were talking about. Like yeah. A, a thousand years from now, what context will they be in, and how will it be read? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but also, it seems like to me, did when you were when you had all of these like dozens and dozens of pieces way back when, were you selecting them out to, you know, because what we're looking at here around us reads kind of, even if you didn't know who you were, it reads as a Western landscape mm -hmm. to a degree. It's like cacti, mm -hmm. it's, you know, snakes, it's things like that. So were you, were you thinking about that from the beginning or those things just kind of selected themselves? I think a combination of the two. You know, everything like presented itself, but at the same time, that's like maybe, it, a world that I'm familiar with, you know? And um, there's that writer, Lawrence Wright, you know, he's really great. And yeah. he has this, uh, <laughs> he's a part of a group in Austin where they, they put up s statues or sculptures, public sculpture, you know? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about the idea that like, you know, 
you want to like enshrine the beliefs of a society through artworks and they celebrate things and, and, and uh, signify things that we value, you know? And it was interesting at a time when like all these statues are being kind of like ripped down. Everyone's mm -hmm. like, well, is this okay? Was this guy bad? Was this? Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like, how about no people, you know? Right. Like everyone's good, everyone's bad, you know? Yeah. And like the idea of animals almost as these archetypes that we follow, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then I was sort of looking at like these pieces and thinking like, well, what would it mean? What would it, what, what would it mean if in a thousand years they dig up a sculpture of a vulture, you know? Mm -hmm. And I have this vulture in my studio. We live, I live in this house, it used to be like a grocery store and I'm in there working and there's an artist in Houston named Mark Flood that we're f familiar with. And uh, like Mark was just out on my porch. She comes, by, there's, a, there's a restaurant nearby that he likes. There's a fried chicken place he likes. So he's always driving by my house and he'll just come. I'll look outside and Mark will be out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Just lurking. And so, yeah, so I, well, and, so I, and so I saw him and said, hey Mark, you know, what's up? And he came in and he saw the vulture and he was like, well, you're just like the people, the hunter-gatherers of Goblecky Tepe. And Which I'm like, well, what the would, hell is Goblecky Tepe? Which is, of course, a reference he would drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was like, well, <laughs> you know, it's a civilization that's like uh, way older than Stonehenge, and they didn't have any doors on their houses, and they, went, they would go through the roof down on ladders, you know, and, and they have this big stone with like a vulture on it, you know? And I started thinking like, well, what, what is a vulture and what does a vulture signify, you know? And it was like this idea that like, a vulture has these sharp claws, a vulture has this beak, yet it chooses to eat like the dead animals along the highway, mm -hmm. you know? And like, it, 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 like it, that's something that like, was it zero waste? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's like something people aspire to, to do. Right. You know, it's cleaning. It's like God's trash, trash man. You know what I mean? Right. And so it's like, yeah, maybe I would want to be a vulture, you know, and maybe, and, uh, you know, and then there's that Dickey quote where he's talking about a chicken, you know, and that a chicken will fight to the death. And that's mm -hmm. something like a man could only hope to be that brave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, and so it's yeah. just kind of thinking about these animals and these critters and looking around and and I and I had moved to Texas and we were living in this town with like 2,000 people and I had this studio that was sort of this corroded uh, metal like kind of barn that I was painting these things in. And it's like, you know, previously when I lived in New York, it'd be like, I'd be painting my studio and I'd go get a burrito, go see the guy at the burrito place and talk or go get a coffee or whatever. And it would be like when I'd walk out of the studio, I'd go down to this dry creek and walk down the creek bed and there would always be this one deer that would be back there and I'd see the deer. And then it was a couple acres behind like this high school football field that, where my studio was. And so I would like walk through the woods and, and then there was a little structure, I think like a horse or a mule had lived in because it ate all the wood on the inside of this this like shed, mm -hmm. but like a fox lived, lived under, there's a little concrete slab and a fox lived under there. And so every day I'd like go in there and the fox would look at me and I'd look at the fox. And so there was this sort of like dialogue with these animals I started having, you know? And I think that kind of influenced the work. Um, when, you, when you told me about that one time, it reminded me of, you know, there's that whole series of writing that Chris Burden did in Topanga Canyon where you know, they were surrounded by coyotes. They were always trying to get their dogs. Right. And he would keep these coyote diaries where, you know, he's watching the coyotes, but the coyotes are really much more so watching him, trying to figure out, like, when am I going to be able to get the dog, and when could I get you, uh -huh. and what are you doing, and what's your ritual, what's your, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And p perhaps in his thinking, like, longing to maybe be domesticated, but really, like, it's not going to happen. It's just, like... If I get your dog, I'm going to eat your dog. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, and, but that, that interaction was super important for him. I mean, thinking about kind of a post-human world the way you're talking about. Yeah, where we live, there are a bunch <laughs> of coyotes in L.A., you know, and it was like, um, 
I found these guys who work for the parks department who are researching urbanized coyotes and their behaviors. And one of the things that they do that coyotes don't do in nature is like, they would, they, there would be a smaller group of like three to four, they operate in smaller packs. And uh, actually what they do to dogs is a female coyote will like go out to the dog and the, and the male coyotes hide. Mm. And it's like, like, hey, big boy, you right. know what I mean? Like, and then, <laughs> right. and then the dog goes over there, and then the coyotes yeah. come out, and they attack the dog. Yeah. You know? yeah. And they don't do that yeah. in nature. Right. And, and it's funny to think about a coyote. I, I was thinking about coyotes like a whole lot, you know? And, and in, in uh, lots of different mythologies, especially in the, in the Southwest, Native American mythologies, the coyote is the trickster, you mm -hmm. know? And like in Africa... In West Africa, the, the, the spider is the trickster, you know? Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about those coyotes and like, and, like, the idea of the trickster. And kind of, like, the trickster being this thing that, like, artists are, you know? It's like Duchamp is a trickster, right? Mm -hmm. Towns Van Zandt is a trickster. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, in Texas, like, this sort of idea of trickery is like a virtue uh -huh. in some regard, you know, mm -hmm. like pulling a fast one or whatever. And even like the most, the pivotal moment of like the Texas's independence was like, they got their ass kicked at the Alamo, but then they snuck up on the Mexican general while he was taking a nap, you know, right. and there's this mythology <laughs> right. of the yellow rose of Texas being yeah. this whore that they sent in to sort right. of seduce him and then he fell asleep yeah. and so it's like almost like something out of greek mythology right. or something you and know? Pe people that the three of us know in texas would say well that's not trickery that's just ingenuity <laughs> right you right know, that's southern just, ingenuity that's yeah. southern ingenuity yeah, man. yeah that's right. like a, a bunch of that's what we call like a bunch of like extension cords mm -hmm. plugged into each other <laughs> exactly you know? that's a, a right. feat of southern ingenuity <laughs> yeah even right. this 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 sculpture here where you have this vine growing up around it that's that's taking on almost like the shape of the of the stump that it's you know crude onto and whatever. There's this plant, which I cannot think of the name of, but I did this exhibition once about um, nature masquerading as a friend when actually it's a foe. And um, there's this plant which um, grows up, like it, it basically latches onto a rose bush and then somehow gets into this, the fibers of the bush and starts to grow up and masquerades as a rose. And so it will grow, and so it starts beginning oh, wow. to, to look, and it, it takes on the whole form of the thorns and the flowers and everything. And then slowly you start to see part of the plant die, and all that's left is the parasite masquerading as the, as the plant that it occupied. Whoa. Yeah, which is like... <laughs> <laughs> um, could, could yeah. be a definition of an yeah. artist. Exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> not to be right, totally. Right. Like, not to be pejorative about it. But. Die. <laughs> I wish I was that clever. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, and like you know, there's a when Dave Hickey died, I was watching all these videos of interviews with him. You know, and really like going back through his, his books and stuff. And there was one interview that I watched. I think it was a Texas Monthly interview. And somehow he said this idea that like the two artists that he knew that were the most alike were Andy Warhol and Willie Nelson. And they were like, well, why? You know? And he was like, well, they both like had this, their power lied in, the, in this like ability to become a mirror. And so anything that you wanted to be, you could see in either one of them. Um, I was going to ask you, because you, you had, this morning, uh, Will sent us both a, a ton of like texts with, I, with some just things, and one of them was this thought, and this kind of gets back to the painted bronzes uh, in Greece, but the thought that paint, paint, paint on bronze is like ketchup on a steak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and you were saying that like the, the people who, at the foundry, in, was it Bastrop? Yeah. That, that make these, like, it's kind of a, almost like a sin to put paint on bronze. Yeah, but, yeah. But, of course, you're having them do it. And it, you know, I, like, I think it, even if I didn't know that this was bronze, it would feel like it. And there's something about paint on bronze that reads a few ways. Like, it does read as, like, there's something about an amusement park feel to it, slightly, or a roadside mm -hmm. uh, attraction. 
and you were saying that this foundry and Bastrop principally doesn't work with fine artists. It does that kind of thing, like pop, pop well, p popular or commercial sculpture for like truck stops and things like that. Yeah, yeah, there's always this conversation. I mean, so like in total, I think I've worked with like four different places. And there's a point that we get to in the production where it's like, well, what kind of patina do you want to do? And I say, just sandblast it. And they're like, and I say, well, I'm going to paint them, you know? And then it's like, oh, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, right. it's like going to the steakhouse and saying, hey, can you bring me a bottle of ketchup, you know? Right. And they're like, well, you don't want to powder coat them or even, you know, it's like, no, just like sandblast them so that the paint can stick to it. And, uh, and, it's a, yeah, it's funny. And then, and then it ends up being like, then if I paint them and then someone sees one painted, they're like, you know, you could have these sprayed. Right. You know? <laughs> and because uh, I just, I paint them with uh, a sign paint, like an enamel sign paint, just mm -hmm. with a brush. Um, and, and they, and, but their primary job is making sculpture that shows up at like right 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 at gas stations or things like that yeah the foundry and bastrop i mean i think they do some stuff for artists but mainly it's like the last time i went there they had a it was like almost like a 40 foot quanta parker outside mm -hmm. then they next to it they had a, a statue of loretta lynn mm -hmm. Some, and then there was a statue that was maybe 15 feet tall of a Baptist preacher that he had commissioned of himself to go in front of his church. Whoa. Right. And then there was about, about 40 cartoon beavers. <laughs> and if you've been to Texas and you've driven through Texas, you might be familiar with a gas station called Bucky's. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like a theme park masquerading as a gas station, convenience store, and they, they're famous because they have the cleanest bathrooms and they have like 50 stalls, you know? And it was like, I, when I lived away from Texas, I looked forward to stopping at Bucky's, and then now I live in Texas, I hate stopping at Bucky's. <laughs> but it's like something just the cleanest bathroom, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, and so, yeah, they make all this, all the sculptures for Bucky's. And, and, Part of the virtue, I guess, of this foundry is that it's close to you, but is there something about the fact that they really work in a kind of a vernacular, you know, maybe kitsch isn't the right word for it, but that they do these like very functional, like commercial sculptures that, that means that they can make these in a way that get, gives you an effect or a, a look that you might not be able to get if you were working for some... Like a more, fine art foundry? More so, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's like everywhere that in LA there are a lot of foundries, and there's the foundries that were close to me, but they were like fine art foundries. And I struggled to find a place that was fucked up enough to where I felt like I belonged there, you know yeah, what I mean? Right. And so I found this place in Ventura that was next to an indoor gun range, and it was essentially just like this... Next to an indoor gun range? Yeah, yeah, so you was just like... <laughs> like right. the whole time. <laughs> And it was this dude who was this old metalhead who would like, he would just talk about the Guns N' Roses days, you know what I mean, when he was on the Sunset Strip. And he, his uncle or somebody had made this, the Iwo Jima, you know, the Marines raising mm -hmm. the flag. And mm -hmm. so he learned from this guy. Um, and it was sort of like the difference between like taking your car to the dealership and going to like a neighborhood mechanic. You know what I mean? Like these fine art foundries, it's like they come, they give you a little drink, a bottle of water, and you sit in a chair, and then they wheel your art out, and you say, oh, I like this, I don't like that, like da 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 And then this place is like, there's like literal explosions going on. <laughs> They're like fire hazards, you know what I mean? And the guy called me and was like, the health department is coming, man. We gotta get all your shit out of here. We gotta paint the walls, and like, you know? Right. And so it's like, uh, and I learned a lot, like I, I learned a lot from him and it was really great to be like super involved with the production. You yeah, know? And, and when they see these finished, painted the way they are, do, 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 I mean, do you think they have an appreciation for what you're up to or, or, do, or do they? The guys in Bastrop, they're just welders. They're just putting together pieces. 
yeah. and they don't give a shit about art and you know what i mean and right. it's just sort of like oh man eagles are cool you know like, that's right cool. <laughs> right especially that's e what's... eagles that have like a bat you know right. and, and by a chain right from it well they didn't see the whole thing yeah, yeah. but uh and they probably wouldn't be unconvinced that they you know they'd feel like they were right if they saw these they'd be like yeah it looks stupid yeah like it still looks as stupid as we thought it was. right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no they're just like <laughs> Yeah, When's lunch? Like you know cartoon. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah cool. there was one time I was making this shark and I brought it over there. A shark? A shark, yeah. And they were like, man, it's been, I don't think we've done a dolphin since the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I guess right. dolphins were big in the 90s. They were like, we haven't right. done a dolphin. And I was like, well, I, I don't think I even said anything. I said, oh, I yeah, know. yeah. 90s are back. You know? <laughs> right. Totally back. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Well, yeah. I was just, I was just wondering if we could talk a bit about like, like who people are within this space. Like when we're all like sitting here in the, this space of this world that's going on, like like the vulture, like a key, like just to go back to him for a minute, like that all around him are like the bones of the dead that he's picked clean and you know like, so like this gallery space becomes this place of invasion in a way, like we're invading the space of, of these things that are, um, like in the middle of stuff and then we come in and we kind of like watch them and it feels almost like yeah it does it feel it feels invasive like they need to go about their business um but also to go back to mark flood it's like once we enter the space it's that imperative eat of eat human flesh that right. <laughs> painting that mark made yeah um where it's like this you you actually feel like slightly under threat being in this space because there's like plenty of evidence that like you got fucked something and bad it's has not happened gonna, gone down, yeah, yeah yeah something bad has happened um but like, how do you think of, of this as like a arena, as like an actual like gladiator coliseum? Do you think of it that way? Like, what is it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like it was sort of, you know, my whole life I've always like, like uh, natural history, natural science museums, and the dioramas, you know? And, uh, and normally they're like behind glass, you know, and, and you, you always want to like yeah, be yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Be with and it's funny talking about Mark because I remember one time we had lunch and I was telling him how I had this dream where I was like inside of a Joseph Cornell mm -hmm. shadow box mm -hmm. and it had a bunch of basketballs in it. <laughs> um, what did you have to drink that night? Yeah, well. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I remembered. Yeah. Um, and so in, in, and then there was a, there's a gun store in Houston called Carter's Country, and the whole store has taxidermy everywhere, you know, so you sort of meander through these aisles, and there's like a bobcat grabbing a uh, quail in the air, there's a deer, there's a bear, you know, there's all these things, and you kind of interact with them. And so, yeah, when I started to think about like this idea of like the figure being absent, then it's sort of like the viewer, there's a, becomes participatory like in the artwork in some way by being here, you know? And is there some like sp specific story that you think of as having transacted in here? Like a, a thing that happened before all the humans were gone? Nothing specific. Yeah. You know, I think it's like loose enough. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like thinking that it's like, especially with the tiger and the dog, like that it's just after, just because like there are these like little remnants, like this dog with this collar that I mentioned, like the fire's still going from like who built that, obviously humans. But um, this, this idea that it's just after and they've all been like left on their own without, without humans and trying to figure out how to be wild again, like the tiger meeting the dog, they've both been domesticated. Like yeah. how, do they, how do they encounter their deepest nature that they've forgotten as a thing? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and rewild themselves um, in, in some way that's like more true than they were while humans um, were in charge of them. Yeah. Sort of letting them, letting them loose to be free. And then I think we end up in, I, there's, you know, we identify with certain animals, you know, mm -hmm. like people, uh, you have an animal that you relate to, you know, or you aspire to be like. And, mm -hmm. 
You know, it's like an eagle. Do people worship eagles? Well, like in Philadelphia, people worship the eagles. <laughs> the eagles, eagles. And, right. you know, it's like, there's a, if you like, you know, there's a band, the eagles. You know, and it's sort of like, you know, and, and people get tattoos of animals, you know, and like I have a tattoo of sort of this like coyote on my arm. And like years ago, um, years ago I was like, I lived in Philadelphia and I was playing pool in this bar in South Philadelphia called Mom's. And I was playing pool against this guy. It was late at night, and it was a, all different people came into this bar. Um, and I was playing pool with this guy, and he was like an old biker guy, you know, like a biker with like a capital B. He was wearing a vest of an um, outlaw motorcycle club. I won't name them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were playing pool for money, and I beat him, and he was mad. And he goes, stay right here. And he left. He went outside the bar and he heard this like, and the guy takes off. Yeah. And me and my friend are like, he was sort of like, I, I fucking dare you to like stay here. You know what I mean? And like, we were like, he's good. Right. right. And so we waited, you know, and it was about 10 minutes and he came back. Out of there. And uh, he came in and he slammed his hand down on the pool table. And then he, and, and he set this ring there. And it was this ring that was sort of like, I think probably originally it was just a wolf. But it was so old and like worn down that kind of like the fur was gone and the nose was like extra long and skinny. And it, and it looked like a coyote, you know? And, uh, and he was like, I was like, what's that? You know, he's like, oh, it's, it's for you, you know? And I was like, he was like, it's your totem. I said, what do you mean? You know, and he's like, it's like, your, it's your God and it's your spirit. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at him and he had an, a ring on every finger of an owl. And then on the tops of both of his hands, he had tattoos of owls. And he had tattoos of owls going all the way <laughs> up his both arms. And he goes, mine's an owl. <laughs> you know? And you still have the ring, I hope. Yeah, actually, the back of it broke, cracked. I was moving a bronze, moving one of these bronze. I have to get it fixed. Hmm. But years later, we were in Florida, like driving through the Keys, like way down in South Florida. And I don't remember uh, why. There's a weird jewelry store, and Stephanie had the guy put diamonds in its eyes. Oh, and I nice. still have it. That's so great. Good. Yeah. yeah, OK, so speaking of owls, there's this, um, just thinking of how objects in here like vultures and different things obviously there's like this undertone of death throughout everything or like it's the possibility of it somebody's died and about to yeah. die and there's all these like you know occasions of of things um avoiding each other if they can um but but thinking of like animals that portend death and there's this this kind of relationship to to what could happen if you see one of those and there's that roy betacek story so roy betacek is a a Texan, he wrote this book that's amazing and everyone should read called um, Adventures of a Texan Naturalist. And it's just kind of like a very gentle look at what's happened to nature in Texas and these different um, landscapes, like what happens when you put a fence up, what happens to wildflowers and all these different things. But he has this one chapter dedicated to animals and folklore. And there's a story of how these two owls seem to want to nest in his backyard. And so he built them a box and he gave them the option, like he built two sides to it. There's the east and west side, like, because he didn't know if they wanted to be on the side the sun rose or the sun set. So they nest on the side that's closest to his neighbor. And his neighbor keeps telling him, like, you know, why'd you put these owls here? Owls always bring death, blah, blah, blah. This is terrible. And Roy's like, this guy's so stupid. Like, this is never going to happen. I'm so glad the owls are here to prove to him that that's a bunch of nonsense. So the next season, they're all you know, hanging out in the backyard. Neighbors are having a gathering. And Roy looks up. And above his scared of owl's friend are the two owls from his yard. Yeah. And they make you know, some sound. And the owl poops on the head of the neighbor that's scared of owls. <laughs> and Roy's like, and two weeks later, she was dead. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 He like, asked the lady, he, asked the, he asked the guy's wife, like, Where, where's your husband? And he's like, well, he's sick. Yeah. And then it was like he saw a doctor going to the house. 
Yeah. And then a week later, there was like a yeah. coroners were there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I there was a, that feeling like th that yeah. book is as good as Walden Pond. It's better, maybe. It's yeah. like yeah. A, it's an if you haven't read it, it's an incredibly underrated classic. Not just mm -hmm. if you love Texas, but it's this guy who sort of approaches it all uh, as a kind of a classicist, and he's kind of agnostic, but it does kind of weirdly keep tipping over just because of his awe at mm. watching these natural processes work. It keeps kind of tipping over into an almost mystical or metaphysical realm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because he just spends so much time around these things and watches how over long periods of time yeah. things change. Like that whole story about the tree and the rock where he's like watching that tree move the rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. or he's, He's figuring out what's happened, like why that rock is at this crazy angle, because the tree has just, you know, mm -hmm. slowly moved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, so beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a really amazing yeah, thing. It's beautiful. But he has this other great story I was remembering today of a of a rattlesnake because he's I don't know if you've read that chapter on mockingbirds, but like the mockingbird keeps attack just to be like a little fucker. The mockingbird keeps attacking the rattlesnake until it's pecked both its eyes out, and then the rattlesnake like totally just like what just happened to me, S like puts his fangs into himself and kills himself with his own, <laughs> yeah. with his own venom. He's just like, well, that's it. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had owls around in a lot when I lived in Los Angeles. And uh, I went out of town to go like install an exhibition. And it was during a drought. So like we had these plants we needed to keep alive. And so I had a friend who came and, and would water the, you know, check on things and spray the plants with some water or whatever. And, uh, it's this guy, Carlos. And Carlos, like, um, when we got back to our house after our trip, the water hose was, like, out by this tree, and it was just running. And it had been running for days. <laughs> and so I was like, is Carlos de is he dead somewhere <laughs> in my yard? You know what I mean? And he wasn't. And I called him. I was like, Carlos, what the hell happened, dude? And he said, oh, well, I was spraying the... I was spraying the... Um, plants and then and then I, I started to feel cold you know I started to feel chilly in my neck he's like, I felt very chilly and my neck was cold and I looked up into the tree and there was an owl there watching me mm -hmm. you know but he didn't say owl he said he's called it la lechuza mm -hmm. so lechuza was watching me mm -hmm. and he said I'm sorry I got scared and I ran to my car and I left <laughs> <laughs> and I looked up what lechuza was. I'd heard it before. It's kind of like, you know, and in Mexico, it's like this, uh, a spirit of a jealous woman that embodies an owl. So like if a husband is doing something bad, mm -hmm. lechuza is going to get him, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the dude was carrying around some burden of guilt yeah, or whatever exactly. that he yeah. didn't want to run into an owl about. Yeah. yeah. And then you know, those also serve as like guardians, right? Like the lechuza, like like the ones that scare away other things, right? Isn't that like the the decoy owl? Is it kind of that too? Oh right. Then yeah. then there are these owls, the yeah. plastic owls yeah. that you put around to keep birds from yeah. coming. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Which has the same kind of yeah fear. I was gonna. I mean, I don't want to get us too far off the yeah. track of this show, but I was gonna, you know, in, in thinking about kind of uh, the way we we make up religions. You know, I remember see, seeing your show in Houston and seeing Sweet Perfume, and you know, it, it really does rank up there for me among like some of my favorite art films ever made. Like Paul McCarthy's Painter and, and Love is the, is the Message by Arthur J. F. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. And I was thinking about the character of Leatherface, and uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 what's the, sort of the short story of this is what? It's like Leatherface, leaves Texas, ends up in California, and sort of finds himself, right? And yeah. then, and, and I was thinking about, you know, like at the beginning of um, Frankenstein, there's an, there's an epigraph from Milton's Paradise Lost, and it's where Adam, or but I think also Satan, is sort of saying like, I didn't ask you to make me. When, when did I ask you to pull me from the void, or whatever? And I always thought about Leatherface in that film of yours, it's almost like, you know, man, I didn't ask for any of this shit. You yeah. put me in a movie, you made me a monster. I'm not, like, I didn't ask for it. And then, like, yeah. goes on this kind of vision quest trying to find himself or something. And um, it seems like a lot of that 
that weaves through your work of these like things that have had a narrative imposed on them that they kind of don't want. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you know, these all, all these objects kind of came from a narrative scenario, right? And then they end up in a bag, all like yeah. pieced, you know, like fragments, just like that you got a piece together. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, I, talking about the making of that movie, how did that come about and what, where did it, you know? At the very end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the sun is coming up and uh, this Leatherface chases this woman out to the highway and I think an 18-wheeler stops and picks her up. I can't remember, it's been too and long. And then there's a moment where there's no one left to kill and it's kind of apparent that Leatherface is a product of his family and his environment and there's no one left to kill and the sun is coming up and he just raises the chainsaw in the air and kind of does this dance. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. And like, and it, I just thought, what like happens next? Yeah. You know, what if he went down the road? And, and California is such a place of like, these people who are, you know, go there to be discovered or to find something or to find themselves. And uh, yeah, I just imagine this narrative where he goes to California and then eventually like everyone is summoned back, you know? And the fucked up thing was like, you know, I, it was the first, the only exhibition I've had in a museum and it happened to be like in Houston where I was from, down the street from where I grew up, where I worked, installing work, where I met incredible artists like Mary Heilman who like encouraged me to like come to New York, you know? Mm. And, and, and so it's this cyclical thing of like the going back and then by spending so much time there, working on the movie, working on the show, it really, it, it, Texas had been this part of my work where I felt like it was kind of like a watering hole. You know, like I would return there once or twice a year and kind of like soak up everything that I could and then go back to where I lived, you know, and make work that was sort of this disjointed thing about that place, you know, and it just sort of became this challenge or this question of like, what if I just go back? What if I just go back, you know? And, and was there a resistance to that? You know, because like Texas is this kind of gravitational force and, um, you know, have, have, having come from there myself and, and then politically, obviously, over the last few years, Texas has become a, a different thing, and so is it, was it a complicated equation to think about going back? I mean, everything's complicated. I felt, it was funny on the way here in the plane, you know, we're, we're lining up to get on the plane, and there's people behind us, it's a family, and the son has like a Yale lacrosse sweatshirt, and uh, it gets to us, and at that point, the lady that works for the airline decides that all the overhead bins are full. Everyone else has to check their bags, starting with <laughs> Stephanie and I and our baby. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the people behind us are just like, well, that's just the Texas attitude. And they start going on and on about Texas. Mm -hmm. The son is like, Dad, did you really not contribute a dollar to the Texas economy while we were here? And he's like, well, besides those three... Starbucks Frappuccinos, we didn't, you know, and it's like this whole thing that we're just like listening to, and, the, and uh, you know, there is this thing where people are like, what, you, like, what's it like to be there, you know, In Texas. And, and I don't know, it's like anywhere else, actually it's not. Well, it's also, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, having grown up there, like, you know, I grew up near Lubbock, yeah. and Houston might as well have been another planet. Yeah. Like, I, I think we went there maybe three times. Right. It was always like, if you came from near Lubbock or Amarillo, people would say, like, well, yeah, oh, God, you don't want to go to Houston. Right. It was a cesspool. You know? Right. Like, so Texas is, I mean, when, you know, it's like many things that are viewed as a sort of a unity or whatever. It's like. Mm -hmm. There's this other thing I was thinking about. different places. Yeah. The, the critters making this show, I was thinking about this thing that happened where, with the band ZZ Top. You know? Yeah. And ZZ Top there's a, is brilliant. You yeah, know what I, mean? I would agree with you. It's <laughs> overlooked. 
I think there's someone who was talking about, I think it was a video I saw of Billy Bob Thornton, and he was like, when I saw ZZ Top, it was like seeing Bugs Bunny in person. You know what I mean? And, and I don't like, know that I understand that analogy, but... I mean, either, I like that. it, you know? And like ZZ, Top, yeah. ZZ Top is David Lynch's favorite band. That makes he loves sense. ZZ Top. <laughs> right. Yeah, and there is this thing ZZ Top did where it was like at that point in time, if you wanted to be this cultural producer, you left, you know? Right. And not only did you leave, you tried to sort of erase the past, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like people like Janis Joplin moved from Port Arthur, Texas, you know, down the road from Houston to San Francisco and was like, I'm from San Francisco, yeah. I'm, you know. And probably very few people knew that Robert Rauschenberg was from Port Arthur. Exactly. You know. right, right, yeah. Right. Rauschenberg. He didn't really claim a Texas mantle. No. As far as I remember. No. What did he say the, that the West Coast, the best thing about the West Coast of Florida is that you can give the entire Texas the middle finger? Really? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, across right. the Gulf of Mexico. Right. But ZZ Top. But so then it. there was this point where ZZ Top was like, no, we're, dub we're tripling down. Mm -hmm. We're not doubling right. down, we're tripling down. And they went on this tour and they brought this caravan of 18 wheelers full of animals. And they called it the Texas World Tour. And they'd go out on stage to play, and every couple songs they'd bring out another animal. And so they'd be this menagerie, like it looked like uh, the nativity scene. You know what I mean? But it would be like a longhorn, and they had a vulture, they had rattlesnakes, armadillos, and they're just like deafening these animals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but there's something really there's beautiful. There's, there's, there's something really beautiful there. Quite yeah. a brilliant yeah. Sort of idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's like where, and you know, with Willie Nelson, it wasn't like you know when he made Redheaded Stranger, he came back to Texas from Nashville and recorded all of that. I think in Austin, and then when they sent uh, some of the finished recordings back to Nashville, they were like, "Oh, these are great. They're demos. So like, when are you going to make the songs?" He's like, "These aren't demos. These are the songs." And, you know, probably, maybe, he couldn't have done that in a Nashville studio. He had to go somewhere where everybody was just going to be like, do it your way. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, he was, he lived in L.A. He lived in Nashville. Mm -hmm. At one point in Nashville, he was in a bar getting drunk, and he was so depressed that he just went out and laid in the street and closed his eyes, hoping that a car would run over him. And then at least he just, Chris Burton did that, but at least he had flares. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes back to Texas, and all this stuff happens. So. Right. Yeah. Right. Homecoming. Yeah. Um, we should probably maybe it's been an hour. We should take yeah. questions. If sure. You, if you want to. Okay. No questions. Okay. Great. That's all right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> That's the way it always works. Oh, the foot. Yeah, so like in the last year, I kind of started um, gluing some of the pieces together, the little pieces I had together. So I had these sort of cacti that I couldn't figure out how to stand up. And at first I started gluing, super gluing them to like quarters. And then I had this uh, like big feet, big foot, big foot's big feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the museum in Houston and I, and I saw these uh, Giacometti sculptures where the base are like these big stretched out feet and then there's kind of one thing. So there we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was an effort to sort of like play with the like the surrealism of like that landscape, the desert, West Texas. All right. Anybody else? So is every, is every piece based off of like a model or playing around or writing them original covers? <laughs> no, they're all like blown up yeah, wow. figurines, and some are like yeah, combine combinations of several things. Wait, and I, I forgot to ask this question. Do you know? Is there any literature about you know like when you think about? Richard Prince, you know, appropriating a, a cowboy photograph from a Marlboro commercial. Like, is there any literature about 
who, when these plastic models were made by those model companies, who made these things? Who decided that that, that tiger was going to look that way specifically? Or Yeah, I don't, I don't want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it might be in court. I, there is a famous illustrator who did the illustrations on the boxes, mm -hmm. but as far as producing the forms, I have no idea. Yeah. And I often wonder if they were produced at a larger scale and then somehow shrunk down. Because of the detail in them? Mm. Yeah, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, Carrie James Marshall uses, um, he, in his uh, studio in Chicago, he's just got drawers and drawers and drawers of these. They're, they're uh, plastic models that are often made of like uh, athletes or celebrities or whatever. And they're made like inc with incredible detail. And he keeps heads, and he said that you know when he's trying to get a certain kind of head just right, it's so much easier than calling in a model. He just looks at the, he just has it up on a little stand, and he paints from the model because the verisimilitude with those models that he's just like, I don't need anything else. So it's kind of it's crazy. And then you think like, what were the models for these? Like that the pose of that dog, or yeah, how a tree looks or a cactus looks. Like where was that coming from? Yeah. It's interesting, and it was interesting looking at all these things because I felt like the, you know, isolating the forms and looking at them, and I found it like the rat, the lowest man on the totem pole, is somehow the most elegant, in my opinion, in the in the show, hmm. formally. Right. Hmm. Any other questions? We scan them with a the computer, uh -huh. and then they, they're milled out of foam. Uh -huh. So it's like a mechanical process that's just sort of like put it in the microwave, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so a lot of times there are these things, that's another conversation, is then we get the big form, and there's these notches, and there's seams, and there's like, there's problematic areas, and I choose to like leave them as part of the, the form, you know? But m most of these you can like carry around yourself. Like you can put them different places and figure out how you want them to look together. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of like playing around with them, but this show, then once we got in the space, it was arranged for the first time here, mm. really. And, and do these come, there's, you know, how many objects in here, but there's the possibility that there's like, hundreds more things like this that are these little interstitial like animals or skulls or snakes or trees or whatever they're coming out of what you have in the models. Yeah, yeah, these are like edited from an even larger, I mean I think I have like, I moved, I think I have eight boxes mm. full of pieces that are this big, mm. like, like bankers boxes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh, can I cast aluminum? There's so no detail. I would think aluminum would be okay. Yeah, there was something about the connection with bronze to like. I can feel it, but I'm just curious. Yeah, we thought we thought about using aluminum, but I felt like them having this relationship to these these like Hellenistic bronzes and being this material that had been used for that long, I felt really interested in sort of putting these forms into like that dialogue. It's been that long. And the, the foundries, the foundries I work with, sometimes it's like, the aluminum, aluminum is a cheaper material, but you find yourself spending a lot more time trying to weld it together than you would with bronze. I'm not advocating for it. It just seems mm. like I, I'm not. It just seems like of any thing that you could use in a bronze. 
Yeah. What, yeah. It's kind of like oil paint, where it's just like this material. Yeah, yeah, you can't tell. Yeah, you really can't tell, and it's sort of like, you know, it, to the people, especially that I work with in the production, it's, a, it's foolish to use bronze. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, I know, it's foolish. I'm a fool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, it, it, if it were painted aluminum, would, you, would it look, could you get the same effect? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that really feels like part of the the idea, and and like a a gesture in and of itself. But you, there's something about these things where you think if you saw these at in some scenario at the Texas State Fair, they wouldn't look out of place. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have, a, they have yeah. a, a sheen about them that feels like they're for something like that. Right, they look like those things that you put a quarter in, that, like a kid rides, like that goes yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. They remind me of, um, you know, these things that they produce uh, at, for high school football teams in Texas. There's a great Jeff Winningham book of photographs from the 70s high school football games. Mm -hmm. and even when I was in high school, one of the schools I went to, the mascot, they have this like effigy of it. And when the team scores a touchdown, this group of boys raise it over their heads and they run up and down along the side of the field. Right, and then there's a human sacrifice. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Larry McMurtry talks about this, this idea, like, do you remember the scene in, in A Narrow Grave when he, is describing how the West is dying, and he can prove it because his grandfather tended cattle, was a rancher. Larry's like the generation, you know, three generations after that, and he's, you know, thinking about whether he's going to or not. He like chooses to do words instead, and his son is riding the horse in front of the grocery store, one of these. Yeah, it's like mm. the, the fake horse. So he's on the mechanical horse. So he's like, yeah, it's done. That's it. Yeah, the West right. Is That's the end of yeah. the. That's the end of the West. Yeah. yeah. Right. Coin op horse. Yep. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Last call. Thanks right. for coming. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank